<laughs> um, okay, so, so this presentation was un, uh, advertised as understanding distributed calculi in Haskell. Um, it's a bit of a problem because I explicitly told them that I will scratch out the Haskell part. Uh, so just so like people who are here, not many of you, uh, understand what this present okay. This presentation is all about. Our chain works on Rolang. Rolang has its foundation in formalism known as this doesn't work, damn it. Uh, in, in row calculus, row calculus is a formalism which is it closes a theory of a, another formalism known as, uh, God damn it, another formalism known as asynchronous pi calculus, and asynchronous pi calculus is an extension of a calculus called pi calculus, and you can reason about what pi calculus is while knowing what uh, lambda calculus is. Why lambda calculus is being a formalism that describes a model of computation, the pi calculus is that one that works on distributed system. So there will be no Haskell, or maybe for people who might be interested, I'm just, I'm just saying that this presentation will basically go from this, this is like, like, like a recap of what lambda calculus is. Based on that, we're gonna go to pi calculus, really skip through over the asynchronous pi calculus, and go to row calculus, and you will get an understanding of what those formalisms are, and be able to actually read the paper and, and, and see the signature. So, if that's not the presentation you were hoping to see, you're open to leave, right, the room, if like you were hoping just for like a, you know, Haskell program, anything like that. So just, you know. Um, my clicker apparently ain't working. I'll try to maybe restart it. But if it doesn't, then I'm, then I'm sad. All right, so, lambda calculus. No, no, not working, all right, cool. Well, lambda calculus. So lambda calculus, as I said, is a formalism. It's a model of computation which allows us to, it's, it's, it's compliant with, with Turing machines and allows us to describe any computation that we would be able to describe on the Turing machine. It's, it's, it's syntax. It's pretty much simple. You might see that any, any term, uh, term in, the, in the syntax is either a variable, so it's some name. It's an abstraction, so it's a, a lambda sign an x, some name, and the continuation, where m will be another term in the lambda calculus. And lastly, there's an application. Think of it as a applying an argument to a function. Um, a few definitions. Duh. So you have a lambda x m. So here, x, we call it that the x is a bound variable. So whenever you see x and it's a, X becomes is somewhere available in the body of M, those two are bound. It, it leads us to something that in lambda calculus is called alpha equivalence. So alpha equivalence means that those two lambda expressions that you, that you see on the left-hand side and the right-hand side are actually the same because they differ only on the names, or the names on the, uh, of those bound variables. So if I exchange all the X's with Z's, and I exchange all the y's with w's, I'm getting pretty much the same expression. So, and there's also a, comf a, con a concept of alpha conversion. So you might say, given I have a lambda expression which has in some x and m, it will be equivalent to a lambda expression which has some y and continuation will be an m, where we exchanged all the, um, all the x's with, within m with y. So it's like, think of it, it's a function that has a parameter, x, and you just rename x into y. And that renaming went through and hold the body of your function. Does it make sense so far? Right, so the other, the other, uh, the other variable that you might see in this lambda expression is y. y is different because it's called free variable. It means that it's not defined in the scope at the beginning of our lambda expression. x is bound, so if we, if we rename x, it, we'll rename it in the continuation, y isn't. It's just a naming convention, uh, nothing really else. The most important thing in lambda calculus, if you think about it as being a model of computation, is beta reduction. Think of beta reduction as just being simply a computation step. You consider it as just running um, hello, uh, uh, 
as just running your lambda expression, as just evaluating it as a next step. So, there are a few simple rules with better reduction. First of all, the first one that we see is just basically an applying an argument to a function. We have some lambda expression which takes an argument x and has a continuation n, and we apply it with m, and what does this mean is that in the next step, we're just gonna get this n where all, um, all x's within n will be exchanged with value with value m. So that's, that's one thing. And um, that's, it. that's pretty much that's all it is. So better reduction in example. Here we have some lambda expression. And so the, 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 first, what the first thing we're going to do is we're going to apply z to an x. So, what are we, so as you can see, in that, just an example here, the lambda x part disappears. We are only left with n only left with n, however, we replace all the, all the occurrences of x with our m. And that's exactly what we're going to do here. So that's a basic, simple, simple lambda calculus. We, we remove x, but we replace all the y's, um, uh, sorry, all these, all these z's with x. And when we do the same step, step with, with w, and essentially at the very end, we just get z. So we just experience an expression that was implemented, that was expressed in lambda calculus, which we evaluated. We, and the beta reduction steps are just simple means of executing that expression. You could think of writing an interpreter that would just do exactly, exactly that. You might be thinking, is, is, you know, is that it? That's, that's pretty much all it is if you think about lambda calculus. And you know, it, it's, a trap. it's a trap, right? We, we don't have any. We don't have any concepts of like numbers or variables, uh, uh, sorry, the concept numbers of, of booleans or things like that. Uh, and they're all, they're all encodings. Sorry, like, I'm sorry, I did something wrong. I can go home. Okay. They want me to leave. And that's, that's it, thank you very much. If you cut me off, I will lose power. Okay. All right. Well, at least we have that. Sorry, but but um, I cannot really plug my computer in. Is that the case? All right. So let me. All right. So so the, the um, I just want to go really quickly through this. Basically, if you look. I'm sorry, but there is no, like, sorry, excuse me? Excuse me? Sorry? No. He knows? Okay. Oh, okay, sorry. All right, so just let me go, let me go, like, without a screen for a minute. So, lambda, it's going to be fun. I can, I can use my hands. It'll be all right. Um, so, so, lambda calculus. For, for new people coming in, yes, there are no slides. Uh, so, so if you look at lambda calculus, it's, it's pretty much them simple. There are only those three concepts, variables, abstractions, and application, and that's pretty much it. But on top of that, you can pretty much create encodings. You can encode numbers, you can encode booleans, and all other stuff. And, and here are some examples, and I will just quickly go through it, um, because I really want to, I don't want to focus um, that much on it, but there is no concept of a function that takes more than, than one argument in lambda calculus. There's something like that doesn't exist. But then again, you could, you could think of a, a syntactic sugar for that, because a function that takes a, two arguments is really a function that takes one argument that returns yet another function that takes the second argument that gives you the final body. You, like, if you do functional programming, you probably know it by name, it's, and you know it's called well, is that, is that caring? Because actually, Haskell Carey stole the papers from this guy. But it doesn't really matter. Uh, the same goes for, for Booleans. Like, you, you, can, you can create uh, encoding for Booleans, and I'll just skip through it and, 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 and for, save for numbers. Now, the question is, lambda calculus is pretty cool to express sequential computation. 
However, living in a world where we have multiple processes, we have software, uh, distributed software living somewhere on the network, is there a formalism that would allow us to, to, to reason about that sort of, that sort of computing, distributed computing? Uh, computing? And uh, fortunately, there is. The nice thing about lambda calculus is that you can observe how the, your algorithm that you defined only by the means of input and output. You, you have some expression in, expressed in lambda calculus, you give it an input, it gives you some output, and, and this is the all, all you really need to, to reason about that expression. The, the, the problem with distributed system is that, is that it's a completely different story, because it depends how you look at it, right? Like, not, two seemingly similar distributed systems might be different in terms of how, how, how they communicate. Do they say in messages over channels, or do they have some sort of, like, do they have, are there some processes running on the, a, a single CPU and they have a shared memory? Um, there are different kind of circumstances that you have to take into consideration where, where you are designing or when you are reasoning about a formalism for distributed computing. So that's, you don't have a single model but you have like a broad spectrum depending on what you get and what you really want from the calculus. Now, uh, in, the, uh, in the 80s, the, there were two formalism. One was created by Robin uh, Milner, uh, Calculus of Communicating Systems, and Tony Hoare, uh, Communicating Sequential Processes. But we're not going to talk about them because the, the more cool one is the one that's called Pi Calculus. So, as, as described, Pi Calculus is a formalism that will allow you to model computation in concurrent distributed systems. Um, it, uh, it gives you, as a lambda calculus gives you, gave you a concept of a function, it gives you a concept of a process. So you have processes, and uh, each process, the process is the exchange messages between each other through channels. That, those are the main sort of um, tools that you use when you reason about uh, computation using Pi calculus. So it gives you processes, it gives you a, um, a parallel composition of processes, it gives you synchronous communication between those through channels, and that's also a, a way for replication of those processes and non-determinism, non um, figure out the non-determinism in your system. It sounds weird, um, let me show you what it actually means. So this is this whole syntax. It, it looks weird, right? It's at, at least it looks twice as complex as lambda calculus, but it really, really isn't. So first of all, your pi calculus expression can be just a process, inner process, do nothing process. It's a process that just started and ended. That's it. That's his, his whole story. It, it looks uh, sad and miserable, and what's the point? But there's actually a point to it. Now. The other one is called input prefix. In prefix. The idea behind input prefix is the following. Given that I have a channel, so this is a process that awaits on a channel X for a message Y. And if the message Y arrives on a channel X, then the process with, will continue with whatever is within P. All right, so it waits for a message and then it continues. Uh, the other one is called output prefix. It means in original syntax, this, this line is, is over here, but I, I, just, I just don't know how to do that in, in Google Docs. So um, that's basically what it is. It means that this time, this process will send a message Y over the channel, uh, over the channel X, and once that message is received by the other party, it will continue with whatever is within, within P. So, here we have a simple example. Model a program that runs a single process P, which sends a message hello over a channel X, and then receives that message on the same channel, all right? So we could try to reason about something like that. We send a message hello on channel X, and then we re uh, receive the same message on that channel X. We should, like, let's see how that actually works. So we, here we have this process, and then we send the message hello over channel X, and then we receive it, and uh, there we go. The problem is, it, it, it's, it's not quite like that. that. That's not how it works. The problem is the following. When we send this message, uh, this part is obviously synchronous. Like, you can, it's, it's intuitive for all of us, at least, uh, I hope, programmers, um, that this part 
is, is synchronous. Like this process here, this part, this continuation waits for some kind of message to arrive on channel X. However, in Pi calculus, and that's the biggest problem of Pi calculus, is the fact that the output, the, the part where it sends the message over the channel, is also synchronous. So this thing will fire its continuation, whatever we have here behind the dot, only when somebody actually will receive a message on this channel, which at this point we are blocked because we are sending a message and there's nobody else waiting for it, for it other than us. But we cannot really continue because we are synchronous. So sending is also blocking. Sending is also the synchronous part. Uh, all right, now we have also the uh, parallel composition, which means that two processes can run in parallel. Uh, and uh, we have a, something which is called restriction. This is, this is the construct that creates a new channel X, which will be unique for the process P. Uh, this letter here is called Ni. So if you've ever seen Monty Python, like you can think me and you remember how to pronounce it. The last part is, uh, okay, so now we can, we can see how it actually works. Um, one important thing is that um, me will bound the variable for us. So same as within lambda calculus. Here, when you look, when you look at this process, you will see that, uh, you will see that uh, x, was, was the x was a, a free variable, was nowhere defined. However, when we create a q, we, uh, the, the knee, so a creation of a new channel bounds this name to the, to, the, to the p, so to the continuation. But it's not really that important, but it's sort of worth knowing. And uh, we have the same concept of, uh, of aqua equivalence as, as, if, as we would have in lambda calculus. Um, Having all that, that's just what we say, we can finally model that computation. So here you have two processes. Process P is sending a message. Process Q is receiving a message. Both, they're doing this on channel X. And then we have a final program R, which creates a new channel X, and then runs P and Q as, as sub-processes. It runs them in parallel, and at the very end, it adds, ends its execution. So, so we have the process R that spawns two processes which run in parallel. The, they both share the same channel X created with the knee um, uh, constructor, constructor, and uh, then P, P sends the hello message. Now there's somebody actually on the other side who receives that. P ends its execution, Q ends its execution, and they're done, and the program is done. Last part is replication. So the, the idea behind replication is that if you have a single copy of P, you can think of it as having a multiple infinite number of of piece. That's, that's really what it is, infinite repl replication of the given process. Um, I, I, there's, so now, having said that, are you guys okay? Not falling asleep? Good, you're good, okay. So, we're gonna get, we're gonna eventually get the raw calculus, I promise, at the very end, but we have to went through the, the, the very basics, which is the pi calculus. Now, there is a concept of structural conjurance, and structural conjurance plays significant role when we're gonna talk about raw calculus in like 10 minutes from now. So it's, it's sort of important to understand the, the idea. So structured conjurance means that two processes act the same and they are different up to the structure, all right? So here are examples. P uh, running in parallel with Q is equivalent to Q running in parallel with P. Uh, same if I have a process that has two subprocesses P and Q and they, it's run in parallel to R, it's exactly structurally equivalent to having a process P that runs in parallel to sub some process that has two sub-processes Q and R. And lastly, if I have a P which is unique, uh, sorry, if I have an, an X channel which is just unique to P, but P also runs in parallel to Q, we can extract that, that, that X to be, uh, to be unique to both P and Q. So those are the rules. Those mean, this means that those the, on the left-hand side and right-hand side are doing the exactly same thing. And the uh, replication here uh, solely represents really what replication means. If I have some process P, it's exactly the same if I had just P, yet and yet replication of P. And you can imagine this will go like, like forever. And uh, yeah, uh, so reduction rules. So reduction rules on pi calculus are exactly the same thing with beta reduction, 
was for lambda calculus. It's the, the description how we can find, like, given that you model some distributed system using PyCalculus, this is how you run it. This is how you do your little interpreter or how you reason about how your program would execute. So, so that arrow here from P to P, P prime represents a single step of computation. Um, and there are a few rules how to run it. And in Lambda Calculus, we only had one. In PyCalculus, there are more than one. So the first one is uh, communication. So given that I have two processes, one is sending a message of Y over channel X, and the other one is receiving message Z on a channel X, it, it means that we will end up with a continuation of whatever process was here behind this after sending. So that just P. And also in parallel, we will have a Q running, so discontinuation. However, well, where all, where all uh, uh, occurrence of Zs were replaced with, with Y. It's pretty much like you, can, it's, you have the intuition that one process sends a message, other one receives it, and they continue with, with their continuations here, uh, P and Q. The other one, the other reduction rule is reduction under, under, uh, under pipe. It's like if, if there is a reduction rule from uh, P to Q, and I have P and R, run, and R running in parallel, and it means Q and R, uh, we can reduce it to Q and R running in parallel. Um, there's also one similar one for uh, if, if we have a new channel P in front of, uh, new channel X in front of P and P reduces to Q. That's equivalent. Like, so, so having a, a creation of channel in front of the process doesn't really stop it from just reducing forward. And uh, this one is pretty important, the reduction under structural constraints. So it means that if I have process P that is equivalent up to the structure with P prime, and I have Q prime that is equivalent to Q, and P prime can be reduced to Q prime, then we can reduce P to Q. So it, it means like, it just basically means they, means the same, they act the same, so they reduce the same. All right, so here we have an example. All right, so there's a ping pong. We have a process P that sends a message uh, that has two processes running ping and pong. Ping is pretty much simple, sends a message ping and then act, waits for pong, pong waits for ping and then sends uh, pong bang. So um, here, here are those in line, I can bring them up. And now we can see how that would, if we would try to evaluate this in PyCalculus, then we would just go through all those rules, reduction rules that we see just a moment ago, and you know, we can just watch the, uh, my amazing uh, uh, simulation uh, in, in, in Google Docs. So, so uh, communication rule allows us to just uh, send the message ping and somebody actually waits for ping. That's awesome, so we are left with those co uh, continuations. The same rule applies to send, somebody sending Pong and somebody else is waiting for Pong. Uh, so those are removed, and now we are only left with uh, zero running in, in parallel with zero. Now, we haven't seen a reduction rule for that, right? There, there, there was non existing one, ex at least in the papers that I've read. You have to understand that when I joined PyroFX, I, I was so scared that there's going to be this, so much formalism I have to learn. I was reading all the papers that I uh, got into my hands on, and I couldn't find a, 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 a reduction rule for this scenario. However, I could find, so there's like a missing equivalence, right? I could find it in Wikipedia over here, where there was, there was no other source of knowledge that would actually tell me that this is actually true. Some people will argue, you know, like the, you know, if it's in Wikipedia, then it's true. So previously when I did this talk, I just called it the Wikipedia equivalence and I just went with it. But I have some guy, some, one of my friends living in London, when he saw my presentation, he actually said like, dude, you're, you're missing basically your sources because in the original book, that, that, that equivalence, I actually have it highlighted, that equivalence, uh, uh, so this reduction rule is actually pretty straightforward in, uh, in defining. It was just missed in the, the papers that, that I've read. Uh, unfortunately, the, 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 the pi calculus was first presented in the book, which I couldn't get my hands on. Um, all right, so uh, here's some other examples, sending channels. So uh, th this is actually what makes pi calculus so unique in, in, in terms of like con comparing to what what other calculus, uh, other formalisms were available before, because here we have a concept that we can send a channel via some other channel to somebody else, 
and that somebody else will be able to use this tunnel to listen for messages and also send messages. So that was so. So here's a a, a simple example. Uh, we have uh, two processes, uh, P and Q, and they run in parallel and they share they share a a, uh, a channel X together. So we can inline it and we can see how how it behaves. So so first of all, what happens is that we send message Y over X, and somebody here will, will receive that message. But as you, can, uh, as you can see in a minute, Y after being sent, so here we send Y, and then after Y just being said, Y is being used this time as a channel that will send messages. So, so, so the important part here is, if you look at this example, R is sending a channel that will be received here and then used to wait for some message H and then used to send some message H. And then we can just go with reduction rules as, as we've seen before. I will, I will skip that because I really want to get to, uh, to the real calculus part really quickly. And that reduces uh, some example of ping pong. Like you can imagine, like it just works, right? The, 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 the tricky part is that here we have the communication reduction can both happen here and here. We have one process that is sending a message ping over the channel X, but there are two processes that wait for it. And there is no rule which one will win. One of them will win, but we don't know which one. And then, then sort of that depends on how the rest of the ex ex execution will work. Uh, there is a concrete example of that in just a second here. Just an example how replication works. It just you know, creates those pings and pongs forever, and they just run forever. Now there's race condition and, and no determinism. Here we have a description of computation running in a distributed environment, represented in, the, in this formalism, and as you will see in a second, with pi calculus, pi calculus we can determine that there is, a, there is no determinism in how it's gonna evaluate. We have race conditions because we are sending message X, uh, sorry, we are sending Y over X and also Z over X. And depending on which process wins, we either get this or that, which eventually, sorry, eventually evaluates to this. So, so we end up with two different results. Now having a non-determinism in the distributed system is not really a, a bizarre thing. It, it sort of happens all the time, but ability to reason about it is something which I would say is pretty cool. Uh, so we have all those benefits, the reason about computation and non-determinism and good to describe protocols, former frameworks and, and, and stuff like that. But there is this problem of this being synchronous by nature. Like if you think about it, you have a mechanism that only allows you to send a message and waits until the other party will receive it. If you have little understanding of how network works, you know this will never be the case. You'll never you never have this guarantee on the living network. So you'll never be able to implement something like that in a wild that it will just work uh, correctly. You would have to implement, I don't know, some, some consensus algorithm. I, I don't even want to try to reason about it. Um, uh, there is some problems with implementations, and in, in, I'll just skip that. Um, and also the, the concept, the problem of that this, is, this theory is not being close, and we will talk about it just in a second. Uh, but before we do that, let's qu jump really quickly to asynchronous pi calculus. So somebody reckon, okay, so if there's pi calculus which is synchronous, what would happen if I had an asynchronous one? So if you read a synchronous paper, they, it's actually pretty cool because like, the guy went crazy. He, he describes the, the distributed computation in terms of uh, bacteria, which have the molecules, and depending if you heat it, it, it will, if you cool it down, the, the, the molecules will, will just match together. If you heat it, they, they sort of divide into smaller molecules. And there's like a lot of complexity just to describe something pretty much simple. I'll just, this is not from the paper, I'm just saying this is the output. While in the pi, this is, so this is synchronous pi calculus. As you remember, in a synchronous pi calculus, in order to have the, when you send a message, in order to have a continuation, somebody has to receive that. And in a synchronous pi calculation, they fix this problem by just simply removing this from the syntax. And that's it. You send a message that there's no continuation to run. That's all you can do. Uh, as I said, this is like a, uh, a, a pseudo syntax because not, that's not how it's really defined, but, but I think it could. Um, and as I said, it's, uh, the benefits are I will not 
put a lot of effort uh, and, and focus on asynchronous spike calculus. The important thing is it's almost as powerful as spike calculus, but up, up, to, up to some point. But you can model a lot of stuff that you would normally be able to model with spike calculus. calculus you can model that, that with a synchronous one. Um, uh, all right, so let's essentially, right now, we are landing in raw, uh, raw calculus, which, as I said, is a foundation to raw lang, which is a language that we use in our chain. So, um, cool thing about it is I think the, 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 the raw calculus paper is the only paper I've ever seen in my life that, that actually uses these smiley faces in a white academic paper. That's pretty cool. Uh, probably Greg having a lot of fun. Um, all right, so... The idea behind raw calculus, what's different? So raw calculus builds up on the asynchronous spike calculus. What is the difference between those two? The essential difference that um, is that in, in asynchronous spike calculus, we, we have a notion, we have an understanding what a process is. However, the concept of a name is, is, is really vague. It's sort of left for the implementators of the, of the formalism. So if you write an interpreter for, for that formalism, that sort of you decide what that is. Maybe it's a socket, maybe it's some sort of channel uh, that, that you use to send messages with, between processes on a single CPU. It's, it's really, we don't know. It's, it's, it's an implementation detail. And the idea was, the question was, could we provide a closed theory? So the theory where not only, not only processes are defined, but also the constructions of names and channels is as well. And that's what the raw calculus um, gives us. So there is a concept of quoting. I don't know if you ever guys seen Lisp as programming language, but Lisp, when they developed Lisp, so just forget about raw calculus for a minute. Lisp uses this, this, this concept of quoting. Lisp is a programming language that is not a uh, higher order language. Uh, you cannot pass a function as a result of running your function. Or you cannot pass a function as an argument to your function. That's completely not, uh, not doable. Uh, because Lisp actually is defined in two languages. There's something which is called S expressions, and those are designed to define programs in Lisp. And there's also, there are also M expressions, which only are solely defined to represent structure, like you know, lists or trees and things like that. Now, the cool thing, even though Lisp wasn't really high order language, you cannot really pass a function as argument. They had a function that would allow you to both go, uh, both, go both ways. You could take a structure, so you could take a program, a, a, a definition of algorithm, and lift it into a structure, represent it as a structure, and then you could also deference it by to the program. So if you would like to have a function that returns a function, what you would just do, you would take a program, quote it, so lift it into, into a structure, send it to somebody else, and then somebody else would just dereference it, would just drop it, and then have a, a program that, which could run it. This, so the, this concept of, of quoting and dropping, right? We, we lift into a structure, and then we drop it. The same concept is applied here. So we are saying that, that names are quoted processes. So that means that in order to create a name, you need to have a process. And the only way that you create a process, uh, the only way you create a name is by quoting or lifting a process. So now you end up with a theory that not only defines the concept of a process, but also the concept of a name. And nothing is left for the implementator to, to define to his own imagination. You have a closed theory. So, how much time do I have? Probably not much. Five minutes? Is that? Um, so really quickly, as previously in PyCalculus, we just had a syntax for processes. Here, we have a syntax that will define as a, 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 an ability to construct a name. So a name is just to quote some process P. By the way, do you guys know how much time do I have? Is, like, is it half pass or we don't know? 30, okay, so like five minutes, so it's gonna be fun. Um, all right, so really, really quickly, same parallel, running things in parallel, nothing new. There is a, a, a concept of lifting. So the idea here is that when you, when you lift, so when you have X lift P, it pretty much means that you will take some process P, you will quote it 
So it will be changed into a, a name, and that name will be available to be sent over some X, over some other name X. So it will be available on that channel. Uh, so if you think about it, it sort of plays the nature of, of, of knee. In, 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 in raw calculus, we don't have knee, but it's, it's sort of almost like very similar. Now, the, the other thing is, is dropping. So dropping is while quoting was taking and process and lifting it to become a name, um, uh, dropping is just an opposite. You have a name and you want to have back a process. Now, the, the tricky part for me for a long time to understand was that it doesn't mean that the process that was uh, lifted to X will execute immediately. There, there needs to be somebody waiting for that, for that process. Uh, yeah, it's, it's basically the sentence. So as a consequence, the pay behavior is that whatever process is, is there is not immediately available, it's inert, except the fact that somebody will send a message uh, to it. Now, uh, here, here is just, like, if you look at the syntax, you will see that there is no, no, no syntax element for sending a message X over, or message Y over channel X, but, uh, but ability to, to do those two things, so, so dropping and, and, and lifting, give you exactly the same equivalent. And, I'm, and I have a, a later on example why that is, but probably we're not gonna get to that, so just believe me that that's, that's what it is. Input is exactly the same as in, in PyCalculus, input was an empty process is an empty process. Now. The problem is, how do we define a first name, right? Because in order to have a process, I need to have a name. In order to have a name, I need to have a process. So that's a sort of like a, a beginning to be in a chicken of an egg. But we can, we can see that, a, a, we, can take a, that we have one single process that is in the nothing process. When, when you apply calculus, it almost has no sense to any, have any reasoning about, that, about the zero process. Here, we actually can use the zero process to construct our, construct our first name. And using other rules, like for example, out output rules, we can construct Y. And, and this is sort of like this game of life where we, you can go on and go on and con construct new names. You have all the necessary needs in order to create new names in your formalism. There, there is no space for sort of implementation detail. Now, there might be some question here, okay, so could I, for example, use this rule? Now, the question is, are those three names the same. We use some rules, but we, we sort of like intuitively see that they sort of mean the same thing. It's like, because if we reduce zero run in parallel in zero, it's pretty much zero. So, so our notion, we, we, we have this idea that probably they should be considered as exactly the same name. So now that's where the, where's the, the, that's where the tricky part kicks in. And I, I promise you probably guys wanna go right now to your hotel and to drink some beer in Berlin. So, but that's the, that's the really cool part about raw calculus. So just stay with me for three minutes and, I'll, and I'm done. I will not continue with my slides, all right? We're good? Three minutes, because that's the actually cool part. Raw calculus has also the concept of structural congruence. So two processes which are considered to be exactly the same processes, they only differ in the structure. Uh, but how do we know whether P is the same as Q? Well, they also have the same as in lambda calculus and in pi calculus, the concept of alpha equivalence. So, so you know, uh, those two uh, processes, they are exactly the same up to the name. You can exchange the name and they will mean the same thing. But now wait a minute. In previous formalisms, the name was something very abstract. Here, we construct the name, so we have to reason, we have to know whether Y is, sorry, Z is exactly the same thing as Z or, or V. We have to have an ability to do the, put the equivalence operator, to know whether those are the same names, right? So, so that becomes a problem because we have also a concept of name equivalence. 
So the first rule of name equivalence is pretty much simple. If you have a, a, a name and you drop it and then you lift it, it's pretty much end up with the same name. That is sort of like you know going up and down, and th those are equivalent. That's pretty much cool. But the other one is a little bit more tricky because we're saying like two names are exact, considered to be the same names if their processes are the same. And I know it's a lot, but it becomes like what? It becomes a, a, a typical chicken and egg pro problem or, you know, if you made them and they made you, who becomes first, right? Because if I, the only reason for, the only way for me to reason about equivalence of names is to understand the equivalence of processes. And the only way to understand the equivalence of processes is to have ability to reason about equivalent names, we have a cycle and we screw it. Now, in the raw calculus paper, they prove, which I will not, that even though there, the cycle exists, it, it sort of diverged to the final result. Because each time you go one level down, process name, process name, you will eventually end up with process zero. So there is a, there is a stop rule in this algorithm. And, and, and there is a proof that you can always um, tell whether two processes are the same or tell whether two names are exactly the same. But it spawns that this sort of this discussion and that's, uh, that's uh, like one of the things that were found during the work on the, on the rural calculus. Uh, I will skip the operation, operation semantics. The, those are pretty cool, uh, but I can tell you guys are already tired. Um, so let's just skip that. It's uh, probably what I want to get to is uh, this. So if what I just said right now uh, seems interesting to you guys, I really, of all these papers that I've read, one particularly points out it's, it's available on, online. You probably recognize the, the author, but it's a chapter from a book which is available online, and it goes from lambda calculus to pine calculus. And if what I just said is completely new to you and you're just sitting here because you're polite and you didn't want to leave it, even though you really wanted to, reading through that paper, sort of chapter in a book, it pretty explains a lot and, and you, you will be good. All other papers are basically being, I mean, I haven't read those, those two, two papers, but the rest of them are, are pretty, pretty self, uh, they, they are not really that hard to, to read and understand. Like you could probably, after a second time, you will, you will get everything. I mean, at, at least I, I, I needed to. Um, and um, ref especially reflective higher order calculus, I've read it first, like when I joined the company, I read it first, I didn't understand a thing. Everything was bizarre. But then when going through pi calculus, asynchronous pi calculus, if you understand those two, and then you end up here, it's pretty much, you know, you understand everything in a paper. And knowing that formalism, raw calculus, uh, sorry, raw lang in, in our chain just becomes like, eh, I've seen it before. Thank you very much. Let's go have some beer.